He was a ray of sunshine. He had a short life, but was a loving son. And a good friend, a dear one, a beloved. He was, and he is, important. He turned sadness into laughter. He never complained. Deaths and funerals are sad. Especially if you only get one life like most people. But lucky for me, I had a second life, and it was incredible. In my miserable first life, I never really did anything of note. But in my second life, I played baseball in the major leagues in the summer, and in the winter, I was a quarterback in the National Football League. In business, I led a Fortune 500 company. In romance, I had tens of tens, maybe more. My name is Riley Adair. You are probably saying that you never heard of Riley Adair. Well, that may be true, but it is also true that I did everything that I said I did and more. Much more. You will understand when you hear about my first life. Welcome to Bill Russo's Short Story Theater. Today's play is the story of Riley Adair. Born in Boston, he was a young boy of considerable promise, but his life was cut short by a car accident. That is to say his first life was ended prematurely, but luckily for him, he was given a second life. And in that encore existence, he reached for the sky and filled his arms with fluffy white clouds and rode them back down to earth. Riley Adair Part 2 was the epitome of success. Whatever he tried, he easily mastered. From business to baseball and from love to football, Riley Adair reached for the stars and grabbed them by the bucket full. Well, this is Riley again. You've been told that my second life was spectacular, but my first life was a melancholy existence for sure. Not the first 10 years. They were okay. I was a normal boy. Played baseball in summer and football in the fall, went to a regular school, teased the girls in the hall, had a goldfish and a spotted dog named Doll. Put quarters in video games down at the mall. I even put pennies on the railroad tracks so they get flattened into little coppery pancakes. That wonderful life came to an end one day after school. It was just one month after my 10th birthday. My mother was driving me to my trumpet lesson. We were driving along Route 95 from Boston, heading down to Bridgewater where my trumpet teacher lived. He was one of the top players in the state and was recommended to me and my mom by our cousin, Tommy Shaw, who played trombone in the house band at Blinstrub's The Number One Supper Club in Beantown. Thanks for taking me to my trumpet lesson walk. I don't mind taking the bus, but it sure is quicker when you take me. Riley, I would take you every day if I could. But I usually can't leave work in the afternoons. But this week, we are slow, so the boss let me take the afternoon off. While you're at your lesson, I'm going to go over to Bridgewater State College and get some information about this school. It might be one of the places you will be interested in checking out, when the time comes. Mom, I'm only 10, that won't be for a long time yet. Well, your dad and I have already started saving money for your tuition, and it really is never too early to start thinking about it. Riley! Brace yourself, that car in front of us is weaving back and forth across the road! Okay, uh, uh, drive, drive, driving along, and all of a sudden, I think I blew a front tire, front tire, front tire or something. Car just, car just, car just went, went off the road. No reason at all. You okay in there? We seem to be okay. No thanks to you. 
If you had kept your hand on the steering wheel instead of that beer can you're holding on to, I think your car would not have crossed over the line and crashed into us. I, I said I was sorry. It, 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 no, no, no harm done. No harm done. No harm done. I said I was sorry. Wrecker will be along any minute. I, I said I was sorry. Within a few minutes, an ambulance arrived. But the attendants paid no attention to us. They were far more worried about the drunken driver who had caused the accident, who by now had passed out. Not from any injuries, but from too much alcohol. They and took the inebriated driver to the hospital to get checked out, without even more than a glance at my mom and me. A policeman told my mother that he would drive us to the hospital, but she told him no. She said we were fine and did not need any treatment from the doctors. She said we were going to wait for the wrecker to come and take our car to the repair shop and then take a taxi home. Just a few minutes after the police left, I lost consciousness and collapsed onto the sidewalk. I woke up in a bed in a hospital room that held a total of four patients. My mother and father were standing over the bed. I remembered the accident but I wasn't sure why I was in the hospital. You suffered a depressed skull fracture, Riley. You've been unconscious, but it looks like you are going to be okay. Mom, was your car wrecked? How bad is the damage? Has the tow truck picked it up yet? Yes, the wrecker came and brought it to the shop. It's all fixed now, just as good as new. That's pretty fast service, Mama. They fixed it in just one day. No, Riley, it was not fixed in a day. You've been here for two weeks, Riley. The doctor says that you might have to stay here a couple more before you can come home. I never went home. I spent the rest of that miserable life in the hospital. And I never left that hospital bed. At least not in that first life. Ah, but, my second life. That life was great. In the second life, I grew up straight and tall. Over six feet and 240 pounds I was. I went to a tryout for the Boston Red Sox of the American League and walked off the field with a contract to play for the team's top minor league ball club, the Paw Sox. I had lunch at Vincenzo's Italian restaurant in Providence and sat two tables away from Ray Patriarca, the mafia boss of all New England. He was a self-made man who left school at the age of eight to become a shoeshine boy and later a bellhop. By the time he was 40, he was in charge of crime in all of New England. You couldn't even steal a hubcap without the okay of Big Ray. At the table next to me sat Buddy Cianci. He was the mayor of Providence for 21 years. He had to leave office when convicted of racketeering. He did four years in a federal pen before getting out and becoming a popular radio and TV host. Now I'm not saying I hung around with those guys, it's just that they were a big part of the New England scene during the period of my second life. You could not listen to a newscast on the radio or watch one on TV without a daily story about Ray Patriarca or Buddy Cianci. I stayed in Providence just one year, before the Red Sox called me up to play in Boston. I had a pretty good rookie season and after it was over I had a tryout with the Boston Patriots of the American Football League. That was in the team's first year. We played in the old Boston Braves baseball field, which was by then owned by Boston University. We had a good year, going 9-4 and four in the old American Football League. I stayed with the Red Sox and the Patriots for one more year. But then one morning, Hey, somebody go get the doctor! The coma patient is awake! 
He is looking at us. He is blinking his eyes. Quick! Get the doctor. Hello, Riley. I'm your nurse. You have been asleep for a long time. Stay with us now, and the doctor will be here in a minute. I stayed awake just long enough to learn that I was connected to a breathing machine and had feeding tubes inserted into me. I realized that I was probably 11 years old now, maybe 12, and I was never going to leave the hospital bed, at least not in this life. The doctor came and told me that he had called my parents and they were on the way. I closed my eyes and lost consciousness, which thankfully returned me to my second life, the one in which I was 6 feet 2 inches tall, weighed 240 pounds, and was a pro baseball and football player. I played professional baseball and pro football for five years, just long enough to accumulate a sizable fortune. Then I retired, fell in love and got married. I was living a storybook life. As time went by we had two children, a girl and then a boy. The girl is 17 now and heading off to college. Riley Jr. is 16 and he's the quarterback on the high school football team and the star pitcher on the baseball team. We moved to South Florida, mostly so that Riley Jr. can play baseball and football 12 months a year. Soon, we will have to fly back to Boston though, because our daughter Mary Ellen is going to start her freshman year at Harvard University. We're ready to board the plane now, but I've got a headache. My wife is worried. I can see that she's talking to me. But I can't hear what she's saying. Suddenly I have gone deaf. Now my vision is fading. I'm calling out to my wife. Surely what's happening to me? Surely. I know I'm saying the words, but she doesn't seem to hear me. Darkness. It's getting dark. I can't see anything. It's over now, Mrs. Adair. We have disconnected the life support systems that have kept your son alive, but in a vegetable state for the last 25 years. We had to disconnect. The monitor showed that your son has had no brain activity for the last seven days. He literally was a living vegetable with no thoughts and no feelings. He's much better off now, Mrs. Adair. Thank you, doctor. I understand what you're telling me. He's been on life support for two and a half decades, but he really has had no life, and he's better off now. That's what you say. I gave him birth and today, when I gave you permission to disconnect life support, I gave him death. You say he's better off dead than existing as a vegetable on life support. You say he's better off now. I don't know, doctor. What do we really know about the human mind? Your instruments could not detect any thoughts, any feelings. But what if there is a deeper brain, one that your instruments cannot detect? You say he's better off now, but with all due respect, I feel like you have just killed my son. What about you, dear friend? 
What do you think? Is there a mind beneath the mind? Is a mind still alive, even though it does not show any readings on the doctor's instruments? People have been known to wake up from comas even after many years of minimal brain activity. In 1984, a man named Terence Wallace woke up from a coma that lasted just 30 days short of 19 years. Did the doctor pull the plug on Riley a day too soon? I wonder. You've been listening to The Second Life of Riley Adair, written by the producer and director of Short Story Theatre Bill Russo. Short Story Theatre is based on the Spreaker Network and can be heard on all podcast sites from Amazon and Apple, to the letter Z. This is Basil Nightingale speaking, thanks for being with us, and please come back again soon. Won't you?